Okay, let's go ahead and get started then with chapter 17 in the Hartmann and Kester textbook that is on tissue culture and micropropagation. So this is one of the most interesting areas uh, because it can be uh, potentially very productive and the plant propagators using this technique can make a high dollar amount per square foot. And also because it has the ability to be used for downstream applications in biotechnology, uh, like uh, different types of plant breeding applications or genetic modification, things of that nature. Um, and it can also be used for conservation purposes as well. Okay, so with tissue culture, we can establish and maintain plant organs. This could be anything from embryos, shoots, roots, even flowers, or potentially just uh, certain plant tissues like uh, cells, callus, which are undifferentiated masses of plant cells, or protoplasts. Protoplasts are going to be essentially the plant cell with the cell wall removed. And then these are gonna be done in sterile conditions, or we can also say aseptic culture. So it will be free from contamination by bacteria and fungi, and hopefully also viruses as well. So we can grow any of these plant parts in tissue culture. Although the recipe that we use for our media is going to heavily influence this, as well as our starting material. So all of these things are possible, but they may not all happen for every single species that you try to tissue culture. Okay, so first of all, we have shoots. That's going to be like the branches and the leaves. And in B here, we have roots. Under C, there are flowers. This is... Always kind of cool to see. We've seen this before uh, with our zinnia plants before where they actually flower in the test tubes. Here you have some tiny bulbs, perhaps for a uh, lily or other uh, plant that's produced from bulbs. Uh, under E, you can see callus and we just have undifferentiated masses of cells. And then on F, we have somatic embryos. So you can see these little embryos look almost like ovules or seeds, but they're actually derived from the body tissues of the plant or uh, somatically generated. Okay, so there are several different techniques that they go over here. Okay, one of which is meristem culture. That's going to be when an explant that uh, just involves the meristem and the leaves and primordial leaves have been removed, usually cut down to about uh, between a half a millimeter and two millimeters in size. And this is especially used for virus elimination. It is uh, very time consuming and it can have a lower success rate. So for that reason, it's not used as commonly for micropropagation anymore, but it's still very important for eliminating plant pathogens. Okay, we can also use a shoot culture involving a stem or a branch that has a few nodes attached. And that's especially used in micropropagation. Uh, when we talk about micropropagation, it's just what it sounds like. It's going to be propagation using very small propagules and usually with a reduced space requirement as well. And also micropropagation is usually geared toward production and often refers to a nursery setting. Okay, so within shoot culture, uh, we could use axillary branching. Okay, we could use nodal cultures. We use that in our class uh, where we took a long shoot and then chopped them down to single nodes. Each node can then become a new plant. They're planted vertically. Um, and then the, those axillary buds eventually begin to sprout and the new shoots can then be cut down and micropropagated into new plants if successful. Next is the stool shoots. 
Okay, the stool shoe is going to be really similar to our shoe culture, but in this case, instead of planting them vertically, they're going to be laid down horizontally. So for any of those that are uh, familiar with the training of branches, this is going to be similar to that. If you lay a, a branch over, then it will sprout at the axillary buds and the axillary buds will begin to grow vertically. So the original branch will be still horizontal, but now you have all of these new plantlets that will come up. And this is often used for woody species or for vines um, in general. And this can be applied in tissue culture as well. Okay, so pseudocorms can be used uh, by taking the growing points. Remember that the uh, orchids are monopods. So we can take the growing points and then form pseudocorms from those. And I believe we have an image of those coming up. Okay, those are uh, specifically applying to orchids. Uh, the Solanum tuberosum or potato plants will form little miniature tubers on little underground stems or in culture stems. And those can be used as new seed potatoes for future plantings. All right, and then next is micrografting. Here we'll use a shoot tip for our scion and then use a, a rootstock, which is derived from a seedling. So very similar to what you've seen with bench grafting or field grafting. But in this case, it's used uh, with a very tiny amount of starting material and it's done under sterile conditions. Okay, this is another one that will, it's pretty fascinating. And you can see we have some images coming up um, involving cacti and things of that nature, but it has a pretty low success rate. Okay, um, so next we have the uh, diploid plant regeneration. And we could start with uh, leaf pieces or petioles. Remember that we used our uh, cotyledons. And here you can uh, also use this for monocots. So here we're going to get shoots from an area where we previously uh, did not have shoots before. And um, by getting these new plant organs, we're able to further propagate plants that have been genetic, <clears throat> excuse me, genetically modified. Okay, and we can also uh, do something called haploid uh, plant culture. And that can be used with, uh, especially with the uh, cereals such as barley or wheat or oats. And here we can take just an anther and have um, only the male parts and the male genetic information, and then culture those anthers and regenerate a plant that is um, only haploid. And this wouldn't be possible without plant tissue culture. Okay, and then for orchids especially, we can get uh, our protocorms from seed. And uh, the orchids typically require an association with mycorrhizae in order to germinate, and they don't uh, propagate very well from seed using traditional methods. So instead, we can use tissue culture in order to propagate the orchids. Okay, um, with embryo rescue, here, you take off the seed coat of the plant and isolate the immature embryo. And then um, you can grow that out in tissue culture. And by using the controlled environment and supplying uh, all of the nutrients needed for the explant, you can sometimes regenerate plants that would otherwise not make it. So the example that they give here is for interspecific crosses where you may have some uh, seeds that do not fully mature, and they may be able to be then regenerated using embryo, embryo rescue and tissue culture. Okay, um, also if you have a uh, callus culture, from there you can have somatic embryogenesis, excuse me. And with somatic embryogenesis, here we can get an embryo, which is gonna be uh, just like a seed, that's generated from 
uh, like a, a leaf or a callus explant rather than uh, starting actually from reproductive tissue. Okay, one of the ways that uh, we can manipulate what type of tissue is formed and what has been done uh, over time with tissue culture is we can manipulate oxen and cytokinin. So you guys may recall that cytokinin is involved in uh, shoot formation. It is going to increase the amount of cell division and typically in that way, it increases the amount of growth. And then also the oxen concentration can be manipulated. And oxen is responsible for apical growth and also encourages rooting. And that's how we usually use oxen in propagation. Uh, there are also some auxins like 2,4-D that will promote callus formation. And if you have a really high auxin concentration, you guys might recall that it can also act as an herbicide. All right, so here, what we have in the figure, under low auxin and high cytokinin, we can expect to see the proliferation of shoots. So we're getting a lot of new leaves and branches, not really too much rooting going on. If we use a similar concentration of auxin and cytokinin, then we will have formation of callus. And then under low cytokinin and high auxin, you can see that we have proliferation of roots. So one of the uh, key ideas between or behind propagation and tissue culture is the idea of plant cell totipotency. And this is the idea that a plant cell can de-differentiate and re-differentiate into another type of cell and can perform a new function. So the idea here is that all plants are stem cells. And the um, older plant cells that are sclerified, of course, are going to be less totipotent. Uh, but in general, plant cells are totipotent. And the example we have here is in carrot. So here under A, we have um, suspended cells. So these are going to be cells that are in a liquid culture that have been broken apart. Okay. Um, and then on B, we can see a single cell clump. And then as they begin to develop into embryos, you can see on C here that we have a little heart-shaped somatic embryo beginning to form. Uh, then under D, there's a germinating somatic embryo. And then if you uh, take these somatic embryos and uh, create a lawn on a Petri dish, you can essentially get a lawn of these little carrots that are growing. And here now in F, we have a single carrot plant isolated from a single somatic embryo. Okay, so let's take a look at a few of these different types of tissue culture systems. Okay, so because it's an aseptic culture, we want to eliminate and exclude any of the microbial growth. On the left here, we have an example of a fungus. Uh, next to that is a yeast, it's another type of fungus. And then under B, usually if you have uh, something slimy, it's bacteria. So even if you have a uh, bacterium that is potentially beneficial in the greenhouse or out in the field, we want to exclude that and eliminate it for tissue culture. Okay, so uh, one of the important characteristics also that we wanna achieve before the plants are uh, ready to come out is going to be stabilization. And uh, the lesson that we can learn here is that you want to start out with young tissue. So if you start out from seedlings, you're going to have the best success. And we've done a little bit of that in the lab in our class. Uh, but you can also start with juvenile material. Um, so let's see. Here we have the, on A, we have 
these kind of weird short shoots. If you look around the bottom or the base of this little propagule and they don't elongate properly. But if we start with juvenile eggplants, then you get something more like B um, and also stump sprouts either from uh, trees that have been chopped down or that have been burned, make really excellent propagules because the material that comes out is more juvenile. Okay, and then you can see on B that these uh, propagules are more stable. Okay, so there are three important phases. And the first here being the isolation phase. And we're going to get the, the first flush here, which is gonna be when those buds that we actually cut off and put into the medium are going to open up and we're going to get pretty quick shoot growth here. Okay, then while those X plants are stabilizing and now all of the new buds that are coming out have actually been born in vitro, if you will, then we're gonna have some unpredictable growth. We might have some slow or periodic growth and it may not be uniform at this stage. Okay, then uh, once we have figured out the best X plants, we figured out the best conditions, including the media and culture conditions, uh, then we can move into the production phase where we're again seeing the type of rapid uniform shoot growth that we were looking for um, and that we saw in the beginning. Okay, and at this point, that's when the plant is ready for commercial culture. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, tobacco leaf disc. And these have been treated with different uh, concentrations of cytokinin. And you can see that as you increase the concentration, you're getting more growth, but you can have too much of a good thing. So here we have uh, an insufficient concentration under A, and we don't really get too much growth. We don't see any shoots on this one, just a little bit of callus. And then if you have too little or a suboptimal amount, then you're getting just a few shoots. You can also see a little bit of callus. Under C, here we have an optimal concentration and we have lots of elongated and stable looking shoots. But then at the super optimal concentration, or if we have too much cytokinin, then here we do have shoots, uh, but they're rather strange looking uh, malformed and they don't elongate properly. Okay, and then here in this instance, you can see that at five micro molar benzyl adenine. We have really nice proliferation of shoots. You can see that the uh, shoots are also properly elongated, but with 20 micromolar BA, which is here on the right hand side, you can see that the plant looks a little bit stunted and it's actually growth limiting at that concentration. Okay, so here is um, an example, and this reminds me a little bit about Michelle Tajati's guest lecture when she was talking about the different uh, things that they would measure when they were looking at efficiency for their protocols. Okay, so here on the x-axis, we have the BA concentration or benzyl adenine concentration in uh, micromolar, and then on the y-axis, number of shoots per explant. Okay, and then they have the first subculture in green, the second subculture is in orange, and the third subculture is in blue. All right, so here you can see that it looks like the number of shoots per explant is pretty similar at 15 and 20, but in this instance, we can see we actually are getting a couple more, so we're going maybe from uh, five and a half to six or six and a half when we go from BA of 15 to BA of 20 on our third subculture. All right, so next, next let's take a look at rooting. Okay, so here we have in A, we have uh, 
the, on the left-hand side, naphthol acetic acid or NAA-treated microcuttings, those have shorter, thicker roots. And then on the right-hand side, we have the IBA-treated microcuttings, okay? And um, IBA is used for the most broad spectrum of species of plants for rooting. And uh, of course, these are longer and thinner. So we get a little bit different response, although in this case, we got uh, rooting in both cases. And then on B, here we have these uh, red bud micro cuttings that were actually rooted ex vitro. So in this instance, they might have been rooted in some sort of hydroponic medium. And then if you look at the root anatomy in vitro versus ex vitro, you can see that the cortex cells under panel C, which is in vitro, are a little bit larger. And then the vascular system is less developed. So what I noticed under C is that the vascular system is a little bit disorganized under C. And also there seems to be more phloem versus xylem. So of course the plants in vitro are under less water stress and also they're provided potentially with a little bit more sugar. Okay, and here we have the stomata on the top panel. These are from ex vitro on the bottom panel. These are from an in vitro leaf surface. And the top panel is uh, covered with wax. To me, it almost looked like they were little trichomes here. Also the stomate itself, the opening is sunken and recessed into the leaf on A, but under B where it's in vitro here, the, uh, the stomate is pretty much exposed and also we don't see that waxy covering. So the plant is missing some of its natural defenses to water loss when it is grown in vitro. And that's why we need to have our um, acclimatization phase. Okay, so let's take a look at these different tissue culture systems. Okay, so looking at A, here we have axillary shoot formation directly from the existing buds of nodal explants. Okay, so they can take either from uh, the shoot tip to get an entire new uh, section here of shoots, and it'll have its own axillary shoots as well. And then you can also take from this section with the axillary nodes, and even though the shoot tip is missing, the uh, axillary buds will be uh, encouraged to sprout and you can see that they become elongated as well. Um, here we have another instance under B where they're doing adventitious shoots, so new leaves and branches coming from tissue that doesn't have buds. So here they're just taking a section of, of wood here that is the internode. It doesn't have any nodes on it. And then they get adventitious shoots at either end. Okay, and then uh, also under B here, a leaf disc is being used and then adventitious shoots are forming uh, directly from that tissue. And that of course being laid horizontally or horizontally instead of vertically. Okay, and then that would be direct adventitious shoot formation. And then indirect adventitious shoot formation involves the formation of callus as an intermediary step. So we start with our leaf disc and then we go into callus and eventually come up with the adventitious shoots. Ooh. Okay, um, and here we have a carnation or dianthus stem and the um, outer leaves have been removed and it's showing the apical meristem and then lateral meristems uh, right alongside it here. Okay, and here we have uh, an A, an X plant. Here, this is just starting out that has several nodes. And then uh, this is going to be put in vitro and we'll get from the axillary buds a proliferation of shoots. So those axillary buds are going to sprout and we'll have new branches and leaves. Okay, and then here under A, 
Here, these plants have apical dominance. So you can see that they are growing straight up. And we have a series of nodes that are just like placed vertically above and below each other. So these can be severed and planted um, as nodal sections with a uh, bud attached to each one. And then on B, here we have the cotyledonary node. And um, here we have some shoot buds that are elongating from that. So we have a number of shoots that are coming from that one. Um, and then also at the axles as well. Okay, so this is what I was talking about with the stool shoots. So here you can see these shoots are actually pretty uh, thin and they might not even do very well if they were put in vertically. Uh, they might just fall over anyway. So these are gonna be actually horizontally placed. All right, they are, will each contain multiple nodes and then from each of those no multiple nodes, we'll have single shoots that arise. Um, and then those are going to become the adventitious shoots that can be further micropropagated or taken out and um, acclimatized or rooted. Okay. And lovely, here we have pseudocorms that were taken from the growing plants or growing points of orchid plants. And um, under under A, we can see where they're proliferating. And you might notice here also that there is a gray or black color in the medium here. And this is from activated charcoal. And it's a common component of the uh, media for orchids because they produce phenolics and the activated charcoal will absorb those um, and basically keeps the medium from needing to be changed as often. All right, and then we have a bunch of little plant lids that are ready for transplanting to the greenhouse under B. Here is the micro-grafted cactus. You can see we have a different little variety that's been grafted onto the top here. All right, and then here is a piece of a leaf and we're seeing directly, not from callus, but we are getting direct formation of adventitious shoots on this leaf explant. All right, now on this one, we have a root explant, and here we have two different types of systems. So on the top, we have direct adventitious shoot formation. So you can see there's a shoot coming right out of the initial explant. And then indirect adventitious shoot formation under B, which has uh, callus and then shoots are coming out of that. One thing that I noticed about this uh, right off the bat is that the one on A looks more stable than the indirect one under B. Okay. And here we have uh, thin layer explants that are derived from epidermal tissue. And then in this case, what we're measuring are uh, the relative location of the mother plant where the explant was taken. So if we look here on the left-hand side, we have uh, the vegetative growth, which is gonna be most of the bottom part of the plant, and then the flowers are at the top. And then, in terms of the distance here, we have the base, then medium, subfloral, which is right beneath, excuse me, beneath the flowers, and then we have the floral region that includes the flowers. Okay, so here they have um, epidermal tissue that they've taken from each. When they take from the base, they're getting 100% shoots, 0% flowers. From the medium area, just above the base, they're getting 75% 70 shoots, 25% flowers. Below the flowers in the subfloral region, they're getting 60% flowers, 40%, or excuse me, 40% flowers, 60% shoots. And then if we go all the way to the floral region, in that case, we're not getting any shoots anymore, and we'll just, we're just going to get flowers, 100%. 
So this would be, again, dependent on what type of plant that you're working with. You might get a lower success rate in general, but the idea being that um, what you can expect is going to be related also to the type of explant that you begin with. Okay, so this one is interesting with the pasta plant. And what I noticed here is they're actually using the flowers as the initial explant. This isn't done with a lot of species, but here they're using the initial flower stem here under A, and then they're getting uh, adventitious shoots, and then in C, we have multiple adventitious shoots that have formed. Okay, great. And here we have lily bulbs. So we can actually get the bulbs from um, either from bulb scales or leaf scales, and then those can regenerate to give uh, new vegetative growth. So we're getting more adventitious shoots here. And then those can be taken out and grown into the full lily plants. Okay, um, we can talk a little more about embryo and seed rescue, as well as callus culture. The cell suspensions, those are those that are grown in liquid medium. And remember that the protoplast cultures are grown with the cell wall removed. So just the living parts of the cell. Okay, so often these callus cultures are grown on petris since they don't have too much primary growth. Um, and then you can also see there, here we have a little bit of this brown callus. We have some green uh, photosynthetic callus and then also some that just looks clear here, potentially having different cellular characteristics or different functions. Okay, so here we have some little pro embryos or things that are developing into embryos. And these are in a liquid culture. This happens to be soybean. Ooh, and now we have a protoplast from tulip leaves and also from petals of tulips. So here the uh, leaf protoplast it looks like they have taken some epidermal cells so here we have at the red arrow, you can see that those cells are just clear. They don't have any uh, chloroplasts in them. And then those that have been taken from the leaves and the palisade and mesophyll uh, layers of the leaves, uh, those cells do have chloroplasts. And those are indicated here by the white arrow. Now the flower petal protoplasts are going to have uh, different plastids, right? They'll have chromoplasts that produce pigments. And the red and blue cells that we can see here have anthocyanins, and those are what contributes to the color of the flower petals. So for example, these might be from petunias. Okay, um, synthetic seeds, these are produced either from a somatic embryo or sometimes just from a, uh, a node that has been encapsulated in calcium chloride and sodium alginate. And the sodium alginate creates a gel that helps to protect this little plantlet and it gives it kind of like a seed type of coating. So that's why it's called synthetic seed. The idea here being that you could take X plants or I should say, um, these little plantlets that are the product of tissue culture and put this in the protective coating, use those for either uh, storage or conservation or possibly even to use out in the field the same way that you would plant seeds. All right, so let's take a look at the somatic embryo. You can see that first it is in a globular phase here, so you can't really uh, tell what it is just yet, but then it begins to take on a familiar seedling type of shape when it's in the cotyledon phase. And then the mature somatic embryo really does kind of look like a seedling with its two cotyledons. 
Okay. And then if we look at C, we have a group of somatic embryos and they're asymmetric. So not completely even. Some of them are still in that little globular or heart-shaped phase. And then others are already um, past germination. Okay, so here we have a uh, example of a transgenic plant that has been created by particle bombardment or bioballistics. And the somatic embryo has um, been successfully inoculated, let's say, with the gene and it is expressing Gus. So Gus is giving it this blue pigment here similar to what we have seen in the articles that we've been reading with our fluorescence marker. Okay, so let's look at a couple of the systems that are used for somatic embryo generation. So first we have a direct, excuse me, direct somatic embryo genesis under A. And then we have the, uh, First, starting with an initiation medium that has 2,4-D, which is an auxin, then that's going to go into a development medium that lacks 2,4-D. We'll see our uh, globular embryos that will begin to form directly from the leaf tissue. Then you'll go um, and the leaf tissue will be transferred right into a uh, subculture medium. This will be the developed medium that has sugar, and it might also have a little bit of abscisic acid. So we may have like a little bit of an osmotic stress here. And then here, it goes into the germination phase. And in that case, we won't have any more hormones or PGRs that are added. Um, and then also, if they're also showing here with calcium, or excuse me, potassium chloride, that they're causing some more osmotic stress to the plant. And it may go through a, a partial desiccation while it's in the cotyledon stage before going into the final stage for germination. Okay, so that is the direct somatic embryogenesis. Remember that the indirect somatic embryogenesis involves callus formation. So that's what we see. We have initiation medium here that has uh, 2,4-D in it. Remember I told you that that is going to um, often stimulate the formation of callus. Here we have the callus which is formed. And then those masses that are going to be pre-embryos and many of them stuck together are going to be put into suspension in a liquid culture. And then those will be screened out put onto the development medium once they're in this uh, cotyledon stage, and then they'll be germinated on a PGR-free medium. So these are two examples of common systems. Okay, um, here we have, oh, cool. So we have um, on A, we have the somatic embryo. This almost looks kind of like a, a slide where we can see the vascular tissue. Um, and then we can see at the on the original explant at the radical tip, we have our somatic embryo that's sticking out here on B as well. Okay, now here from um, callus, we have somatic embryo induction. And on A, here we have the polyembryonic masses. So here with that mass of under differentiated callus cell is now starting to differentiate into embryos. Um, and that would be in a liquid culture, suspension culture containing 2,4-D. And then when it's moved into a, a stationary development medium with no 2,4-D, then we're going to see that formation of the somatic embryos themselves. So another thing that um, I actually forgot to mention about the suspension cultures is that they're often going to be agitated pretty frequently in order to uh, keep them from coming into one big clump. 
Okay. And here we have uh, the Sayaguauca, okay, which is a spruce. And we have our different developmental stages of somatic embryogenesis. So starting with A, we have an immature somatic embryo. This is very interesting. It almost looks like a glass in its early developmental stage um, here in B. And then on C here, we have an immature, or excuse me, yes, an immature somatic embryo and it's pre-cotyledonary. So you can see we kind of have a little heart-shaped clump up at the top. In D, here we have the mature embryo and it has well-developed cotyledons. And then finally in E, we can see the uh, seedling that was derived from the somatic embryo. All right, and then we looked at one of the nice somatic embryos from Circus canadensis. Now let's look at a malformed embryo. Uh, so first we have the uh, microscope image here on the left. And it has kind of these weird cotyledons, you know, you have like one that's longer than the other. And then if you look here, there it doesn't look like there's any shoot tip that's forming here in the center. Okay. And then uh, next on B, we have a uh, strap-like and then like really kind of thick fasciated cotyledons here at the red arrow and then, or excuse me, at the white arrow. And then at the red arrow, the cotyledons are actually fused together and they don't have the apical meristem. Okay, great. So next, let's focus on environmental controls and uh, how the tissue culture environment is maintained. Okay, so one thing that is helpful here is that growth can be slowed by refrigerating some plants. Okay, so that's where we can see we have uh, plants that are coming out of storage. These are restart cultures under A. And uh, they look kind of yellow or whitish because they're etiolated. They have been in the dark in the storage room. And then the end or B, we have the restart cultures that are coming out and those are being reinitiated toward the goal of multiplying shoots. Okay, so things that need to be controlled here include temperature. Okay, so we want to have our uh, temperature similar to that of what we would have in the propagation environment, although it will vary for different species. So I would suggest about 74 degrees. You may even have bottom heat up to 85 degrees. We want to provide sufficient light, also potentially controlling our light intensity as we're moving plants through the different stages towards acclimation. And also the photo period and the light quality or the color of the light need to be controlled. So we wanna make sure that our light falls within our PAR range or our photosynthetically active radiation, especially including red and blue wavelengths. And then with the photo period, of course we know that some plants may be photo period sensitive and their uh, vegetative stage might be controlled by the day length or the night length. And then ideally, if we have uh, photosynthetic cultures, then we want to provide an environment that um, has enough CO2. We want to control our humidity levels. Um, and then there also may be some, um, some instances where there are materials in the lab that can um, emit volatile uh, organic substances or uh, volatile organic compounds, VOCs. Uh, these might include things like paints or epoxies. So if those are being released into the room, it can actually toxify the plants as well. Okay, so some of the problems that we come across here involve hypohydricity or excuse me, hyperhydricity, which is when um, the plants form those glassy, delicate, and unstable shoots. 
Uh, we may have internal pathogens that cannot be removed by surface sterilization. We might have excessive exudation of plant compounds where the plant is actually now toxifying the media and poisoning itself. Uh, we might have instances where the shoe tips actually die off. Um, and then we also may have problems with uh, proliferation and habituation. So here's an example of a hyperhydric or a vitrified plant. And you can see the leaves look almost kind of clear or translucent and they look wet, they look water soaked. This is an example of um, grape culture. Okay, here we have the example of hyper exudation. And you can see here that um, under A, there's exudation perhaps from tannins and that's giving a dark coloration of the callus. And then the medium is also taking that in and feeding it right back to the plant. Under B, here we have explants that were treated with an antioxidant and we're given the option of something like citric acid or ascorbic acid. Um, and then also activated charcoal, which is a media additive that can help to limit that exudation. And then because it absorbs the compound, the shoots are able to grow uh, and prol proliferate much better. Oh my goodness. And we also have shoot tip necrosis. So you can see here at the arrows where the shoot tips have died off. And this is in, on the left we have Quercus alba, and then we have our Sturcis canadensis on the right under B. So here, even though the culture became established and it created some nodes, the shoot tips are necrotic and they uh, fail to develop. So if you wind up losing all of your shoot tips, then the plant is no longer going to be able to grow. Okay, so here, in regards to habituation, this is the continued growth in tissue culture without continuing to add the plant growth regulators. Ooh, so here we have the pawpaw tree and these cultures um, have been cultured for many years on a cytokine medium and then they have developed habituation for shoot formation. So a good example of this other than just considering using the youngest tissue would be that if you can take from plants that are already in vitro, so you may have sterile plantlets in vitro, or from plants that have just already been through the process, even if they've already gone through acclimation, um, then they may become more habituated to tissue culture and you're gonna see a higher success rate. Okay, um, so there are some other plant, plant problems that can come up. Okay, we're expecting that our tissue culture plants are going to be clones of one another here. Um, and there could be interest in instances where we have chimeras, like we saw in our chapter on cuttings, and these can be causes of genetic variation. So one of the ways to control this variation is going to be through roguing. So if you see an off type, then you're going to want to get rid of it. Um, and in terms of uh, transient photo phenotypic variation, we might see uh, increases in vigor, changes in the developmental stage. So going from uh, juvenile to less juvenile stage, for example, and then uh, branching that's different from what we're used to seeing. Okay, and uh, another thing here is that we can see epigenetic variation. So when we take our, our clones and we um, do, let's say we're doing propagation by cuttings and you continue to take a clone from uh, the same plant and then from the next generation of that plant and so on, it's almost like taking a copy of a copy of a copy and um, after a while, these stock plants can kind of become old and tired. There's a little bit of variation that can arise. So especially through meristem culture, but also often through nodal culture, we can see that there is a re 
rejuvenation um, and an improvement because potentially with the um, epigenetics, although all of the genes were present, some of those genes may have been methylated or silenced. So after uh, going through the tissue culture process, sometimes those uh, cultivars can be rejuvenated or invigorated by that process. Okay, and potentially also um, in that sense, giving uh, more sites for fruiting and flowering and just a, a general um, effect on yield toward the increase. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these different types of variation. And the first one is chimera. So this is uh, difficult because, for example, if you think about taking um, some, like a cutting that involves a bud or an axillary shoot, or if you're going for the meristem itself, you want to be careful that you maintain the proper phenotype, that you don't accidentally, you know, only scrape off one of the phenotypes and propagate that. For example, if you're doing meristem culture. Okay, and then you can see here on A that we actually get some variation that it could be desirable, right? Because we have all of these different uh, chimeras as a result. All right, and then here on B, we have a rhododendron that is uh, fasciated. And uh, this might just be because of the environmental condition. So it could be a transient type. It doesn't necessarily mean that we have genetic variation here. And then under C, here we have an increase in uh, basal branching on echinacea. And this is something that's typical that happens after micropropagation of that particular species. Okay, and then let's take a look at the next figure. So rejuvenation after micropropagation uh, can be seen in the ability of those plants to root easily under mispropagation. So this can be an advantage for propagators as well. Um, if you start with micropropagated stock plants, you may see an increase in uh, rooting, or I should say a decrease in the amount of time taken for rooting to occur. Okay, and then we can see also some maple plants under B that were recently propagated. 